around. It is talking about how do we develop these skills for jobs we don't have. For example, how do I train a student to be able to train robots? Which I thought that was kind of interesting. Or I think the robot mediator is kind of funny. Like I'm like, do we really have to mediate robots now too? Are they gonna start fighting with each other? I mean, I don't know what's gonna happen. And then the drone traffic controller. On our 4th of July, because I'm from Ohio, in the States, on 4th of July at Coney Island, they literally were dropping hot dogs from the sky using the drones. Could you imagine walking outside and a hot dog just falls from the sky? I mean, I'm a vegetarian, but I would still be pretty excited if a hot dog comes from the sky. But anyway, so the reason why we're doing it is to get ready for the jobs of the future. When I am not doing this, I'm actually a surfer. I know, kind of cool, right? So we go all over surfing, and one of the schools that we're in California, one of my teachers, one of them coaching her, she grabs a surfboard, and her and I go down to the beach, and we surf after we get done coaching for the day. But I live in Ohio. If you know where Ohio is, I'm in the middle of the state. How am I a surfer in the middle of the country? Well, I can't do it behind my boat. That was my nephew really cheering me up. So we can actually surf behind our boat, too. Why am I telling you this? Because you can learn a lot from surfers. It's pretty impressive with what they do and how they do it. They really sit there and it looks so easy, right? Like that guy just stood up and he's riding away. Have any of you tried to surf? Is it that easy? Wow, this is the most I've ever had. Is it easy? Is it easy? No? No? But it, it looks easy. There's a lot that goes into it. When you guys took your surf lessons, right? You probably paid like $200 for a two hour work, like two hour lesson. Does that sound about right? $150? Now, where did you go? Where did you surf at? Huntington Beach, where else? Where? Okay. Anybody else? Okay. So, anyway, the surfers want you to do a surfing lesson, right? Where you actually sit on the shore and they teach you how to like pop. For one hour, they will sit on the beach and they will teach you how to do this. This, what they're going to do next is they're going to actually show you the pop. What does that look like? And eventually they go up the water, they give you a little push, and off you go. How in the world does any of this have to do with one another? Everything. Because, first of all, they are always thinking about the line, meaning they're not worried about the way that just went by, they're not worried about the way that's coming up next. They're in that moment. Two, they watch and learn. Before a surfer goes out, they'll seriously sit there and watch each other before they go and take off into the water. And then they find the balance. Let's start with teaching you about the line. Anybody know this guy? If you're not into football, you might not. It's like Urban Meyer, the Ohio State football coach. He's actually one of my good friends. And he wrote a book called A Fall the Line. Long story short, he says that you have a decision to make every single day. The decision is you can sit there, you can blame, you can be in denial. Or what you can do is take accountability, responsibility, and ownership for what happens. So what he was talking about is you can make excuses why you can't use technology. Why well, students don't know how to do it. Or you can say, I'm going to teach them. They're going to figure this out, and they're going to be able to learn their own pace and place and path. Here's an example of a teacher that one took accountability for her classroom environment. That one is it. It's a play video. It is. So she went to one of my workshops. She came to one of my workshops, about a two-hour workshop. I went into her classroom afterwards, and she has her kindergarten kids using digital content, hands-on activities. They're rotating with the timer, and everything is tied together. So they're working on identifying letters and writing their name. So they're practicing in a mini lesson. They're doing it with paint colors. They're online using online programs that are going to help them. And then, of course, they're doing side of reading because it's a language arts classroom. The point is, this teacher went above the line, and she said, I'm going to change up my environment. I'm not just going to do centers just to do centers. I'm going to do centers with a cause. The focus is learning how to write their name. Here's one, another example of a teacher that went above the line. This teacher, instead of having kids just do a worksheet, She's having them go in and do Jenga. When the kids pull out that Jenga piece, you guys have played Jenga before, right? When you go and pull out a piece of Jenga, they had to answer that question. 
do you do? You pulled out number five, you pulled out number 24, you pulled out number 40, I pulled out number six. We all work on our questions, we all look to see what we have, and we try to build our tower as tall as we can. The life skill we were just setting up, Jingo, was really fascinating to watch. I love that. Just watch the kids and seeing how they actually put the pieces together. I thought that was pretty cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how we can put that little bit of a twist into your classroom. So we teach above that line. I walked into a, this is a fifth grade classroom, a fifth grade science classroom. I walked in and I saw the student doing this to his computer. You see what he's doing? He's like distorting his face, making his face all crazy. But do your students do that here in Canada? Yes? Do they? Okay, I think that's kind of funny, right? Now, of course, you're online, so you don't get to see them if they're doing it, right? But the whole point is, I sat there and I was watching this kid do this, his snapped photo, the kids left, the teacher is sitting there, he goes, who are you, and why are you in my classroom? And I'm like, oh, hi, I'm Marcia, I'm a, your instructional coach. Your district hired me to come in and help you transform your classroom. And he goes, great, what would you do? Like, when you teach that class next, that subject, because he's a science teacher, he's like, I teach it in 40 minutes. I'm like, perfect, let's do it. The two of us, on the spot, sat down, we redesigned his classroom, we redesigned his lesson. In 20 minutes, we developed this. He had a student teacher, but he had a mini lesson area. So again, this is a class that the kid was making faces on his computer. So he had a mini lesson area. He was doing independent practice, which was on the computer that day, where they're going in and doing a Google form, and digital content. The he was a science teacher, he was using brain pot to teach him about the skill of the water cycle. They're doing brain pop. One activity you didn't see them do, it was back behind me, was a group of students were doing a cutting and creating a water cycle diagram. That same lesson that the kid was completely bored with, we transformed in 20 minutes. The number one thing we did, we changed his face. You change your face, you change your mindset. So he said, oh, I love it. I was just in this classroom last Friday. He still is having it and it's running every day this way. In fact, he's so excited. He's getting feedback chairs now, and he's really excited about how he's adding more furniture to this classroom. But that's what we're talking about. Things would happen. I happened to him, right? That was his event. How we responded was his outcome. That's the biggest takeaway. When things happen to you, how do you respond? Right? Okay. We're going to do a quick little game here. We're going to do a game called Speed Dating. Have you guys done this before? Okay, we're going to make some love connection. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to stand up, we're going to make two giant circles, an outside circle and an inside circle. I'm going to ask you a series of questions, four questions, and after one minute, you will rotate to the other person. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I'll explain more when we get into our circles. So go ahead, get up into two circles, one big outside circle, one inside circle. This will be fun, I promise. <laughs> Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to kind of partner up, so you're going to like face face at it like this. You guys are partners. Oh, keep coming, come on. I know, it's kind of hard with this room. Come on over, come on over. Come here, come here, perfect. Come here. Thanks. Maybe you just keep a little belly over that. Come on. Here we go, rotate. Uh, there we go. Okay, there you go. Perfect. Okay. If you feel like you're on the outside circle, raise your hand. Okay, if you guys will move. If you feel like you're on the inside circle, you don't move. Okay? Get in the circle. <laughs> All right. Here is our first question. What did you do over the weekend, last weekend? Go ahead, talk back and forth. You're going to share out. What did you do last weekend? I was supposed to be talking back and forth.
Okay, outside circle, you're going to move clockwise. Ready? Outside circle, move one person over. Here we go. Next question. What is something new you have tried in your classroom or have helped people try? Something new. Thanksgiving. So that's kind of fun. I'm like, oh, tell me about your Thanksgiving. Okay, so what are you going to say? 
I was just going to say that um, it just it reduces the risk environment for, uh, for students who often are uncomfortable talking in under large groups. Or, right, of course, it reduces the risk. And what we do sometimes in the see is when we do reduce that risk, we have the two desks and they're facing each other, and the kids can still sit down, they're not standing up, they're having those conversations. I have 20 nieces and nephews from ages of 16 to six months. No, no children on my own. But the point is, though, a lot of my older students, our older nieces and nephews, don't have great communication skills because they're doing all this, right? So we can say for novel, click novel, an exit ticket. You don't have to do vocabulary questions, right? You do not have to call it speed dating. I call it speed dating because like, it's funny, like, oh, let's find a love connection, right? And we're adults, so we can handle it. But kids might not. So this little speed dating activity is something we're going to do and talk about. You can put it in your classroom. But the whole reason why I did that was to find out your true definition of what is blended learning. When you define blended learning, what was your definition? Yeah, I know, be shy. <laughs> yeah, go for it, sir. I, I, uh, I work with ADLC, so basically I track and facilitate homeschool kids, and we work with both print and online courses. So I guess my definition of blended learning would be a combination of print and online. Oh, I like it. So print and online. Okay, I like it. Do you feel like you're a valuable part in your online classes when you're teaching? No. This is my teaching part. But yeah, we're together. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yes, I, I do. But I think. Like our definition of blended learning might be coming from a different team side. Okay. So I think that often we think of blended learning as a classroom where technology is incorporated in, to, to address learning. Uh, whereas we started with the online piece and now we bring our students in. So, gotcha. so now we, we have this piece here and now we bring our students in. So it's still blended. It's still but blended. It's coming from the reverse way. Okay, so I just want to give you background information about myself too. I actually started with the learning high school. So I did it where it was kids were learning at home and they came to me. So I'm in, in your shoes. But you probably don't get your kids coming to you all the time. But a lot of people say that blended learning means integrated technology. But it's not. It's allowing students to work at their own pace, place, and path. And everything's driven by data. Let's break this down. So it's not always the technology, but it's a mix of the technology, right? It's a mix of using a teacher. It's basically drawing all your best practices into a true blender, mixing it up, and here we go. So when I'm talking about pace, I mean this, and you could do it where your students are working on this environment too. Even if you're online, you can do this. Pace means that the students have the ability to work through the content at their own pace. So they're ready to move on to the next chapter, they move on to the next chapter. This is a high school chemistry example. I do have an elementary. I just want to show you this though. When she's moving, she moves to the next activity. We use an elementary in a brick and mortar environment. Instead of a big giant board, we create what's called Blendopoly, where the kids are moving in a monopoly board doing the different activities. So this is chapter one, this would be chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, so on and so forth. So forth, so forth. But if you don't want to just do chapters, you can do like chapter 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. We started the blend out late because of the fact that blending kids work at their own pace, but also because we're gifted students. We're just turning in crap. They were just getting it done just to get it done. And when they turned in stuff that wasn't good, we sent them to jail. <laughs> this is a jail, right? I sent three kids and students to jail, and that's the last time that they went. Everybody else really completed their work. So we're talking about working at your own pace. We're implementing progression boards. This is an example of a progression board. This is a just paper, pencil, what it's looking like. And no, it does not mean that you're ahead or behind. It's just showing you where you are, where you're going to go to next. But we're talking about path. This journey here is talking about how she's using checklists in her classroom. Checklists, yes, we use checklists all the way down to kindergarten and first grade. Here's an example of a first grade checklist. A checklist allows the students to look at the list of different activities. Online schools and brick and mortar schools can do this. Where she is going to, and she's working on her checklist, here's me asking her question. Is this your third one today? Is this your third one today? 
confusing. So, why? It's confusing not having a checklist. So I'd like to know what I can do and what I've already done. Do you want a paper and pencil or do you like having a digital? Paper and pencil. Why? It's a list. You don't have to just stare at the screen all day. Ah, so having a paper pencil check off is good. Yeah. Do you like one format better than the other? Because I saw your science teacher had a whole sheet, your math teacher had two on one day. Does it make one, one easier than the other? It's all easy if you're used to it. So what she's talking about is, it wasn't easy for her day I called that student around by chance and then that one day she had five different checklists that she's going through and I asked her if one was easier than the other she's like no it's just easy you just get used to it they would rather have a list of things that they could do so if you're working in an online environment set up like a Google Keep or set up a, a system of check off list where the kids have the ability to see what they have to do to keep moving forward if you already have something in place it's great but if not, I'll pass around this little folder. You can take a look at some sample checklists that we implement from kindergarten all the way up to college. So a checklist allows the students to work at their own path. They can do first, second, and third. This next one is talking about place. What do we mean by place? Students have the ability to work online, offline, standing up, sitting down, working with their friends, working in a mini lesson. So the ability for them to kind of pick and choose where they want to work is what blended learning is about. But most importantly, sometimes when we see place, we think of things that are out of the ordinary. Like if this is my classroom, this would be an amazing place to have like some really cool beanbag chairs, standing high top tables. In fact, if there was a projector that I could quickly move, I would put it into that little cafe. Because that environment is so much better than these gray, dark walls, right? Changing your space changes your environment. And sometimes it's as easy as finding your laundry basket. And this next photo, I do not stage. I literally walked into this classroom. This is a four day classroom in California. And this little girl was standing like this. <laughs> with her foot above her head and it's backwards. So we're talking about place. What makes you feel comfortable? Sitting at these round tables all day makes me claustrophobic. I'm like, ah, I just want to be able to move, right? So that's what we mean by pace, place, and path, but most importantly, data. If you're an online teacher, if you're a brick and mortar teacher, if you don't know where your students are, how can you let them go to the next step? How can you keep pushing them forward? Data boards. We implement a lot of data boards. Here's an example of a data folder that I will pass around. This data folder helps to drive the students. So every Monday, we sit down and we put together their data. Where is it? Where's your goals? What are you going to be working on? What are you going to do next? Okay. So pace, place, path, driven by data is the true definition of blended learning. It comes from Michael Horn. Michael Horn from the Christensen Institute wrote a good book about blended learning and the history of it. Reads about chapter four, put it down, and say, hey, that was good. Don't go any further because it's dry and boring. But the beginning part is really good about what I'm telling you. It's true. So now, now we have the same definition. Everything you said was right. I just put in a cute little thing. Pace, place, path, driven by data. So if you're an online school, if you're a brick and mortar school, or if you're a combination, that's what our main focus is. Now, the fun part. Let's see it in action. So we developed what's called three phases of blended learning. Because if I say go into your fifth grade classroom and create pace, place, path, you look at me like I'm crazy. How do I do that? So what we have done is taken and created that whole phase process and we broke it up to three phases. Phase one is what most people call station rotation, where I have a timer, my timer goes off, every 10 minutes I rotate to the next activity, going from a mini lesson, independent, digital content, future ready skill. Even in kindergarten, which you just saw, that's what we're talking about. Here's another kindergarten example. I pick kindergarten to see what think it can happen. If these kindergarten kids can do it, you can do it, right? So here's a hands-on activity. That's a future-ready skill. You're creating, you're collaborating, you're working. Ignore the tall people in the room. They're just with me on the tour. There is a mini lesson. You'll see the digital content back here. And then there is one other activity which you won't see where they're actually doing independent work, where they were doing some like sorting. It's a math class. So they were doing some sorting activity. When they got done sorting, they took a photo using Seesaw. You guys using Seesaw.me? They took a photo using Seesaw and they shared it to the classroom. 
All of this happens if kids work in this environment every single day, and they rotate from one activity to the next when the timer goes off. Phase one. It's really easy because we just take what you normally do, we break it up into four parts. How many people feel like they're doing that? Centers? Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. You're like, how do I do that? You would just take your traditional lesson that you would normally teach, just have kids do, but you define it. Here's your mini lesson. You need to come my mini lesson with me first. Here's my independent work. Here's your digital content. And here's something you would do hands on. Go find some cubes, go find something, build it, take a photo, send it to me. Because okay? I bet with the online world, those hands on activities are kind of part of our routine because they don't always have all the hands on stuff. Phase two. Whoa, what is going on with phase two? We got rid of your timer. Now we're starting to allow the students to work at their own pace and they get paid what they want to work on. So we get rid of the timer. I'm going to give a high, medium, and a low mini lesson. I'm going to give high, medium, and low independent practice. I'm going to give high, medium, and low digital content. And I'm going to give choice to the future ready skill. You're like, how am I going to do that? Well, believe it or not, your digital content, you're using the right resources, such as Freckle.com, Prodigy, anybody know any of these yet? Mm -hmm. Freckle.com, Prodigy, No Red Ink, Uzella, all of those are adaptive technology where it automatically puts the kids in those levels. You don't have to do anything with them. Your independent practice, this is where you probably spend the most time. There's still resources out there. This is where you have to go find high, medium, and low for your kids. But your mini lesson, all you have to do is go in and you just have to start asking, you know, you're going to adapt your mini lesson, giving harder content, making it easier, making it harder. So the one place you can spend the most time would be probably independent. Ask you a question. You bet. So this, yes, I do, but with the timer only, and this is why I'm asking this question, only because I'll have grouped my kids for mini lessons according to what their needs are. Okay. So if they're working at their own pace, because I really like the idea of their own pace, right? But if they're working at their own pace, how do you organize that for when they, if they're randomly coming to you at different times to have, well, is that what you're going to do? Yes, but I'm going to give it to you right now. Okay. I'm not going to wait. So sure, she's asking, if I give them a checklist, they're going through the checklist, they're able to work at their own pace. How do I do that? So I'm going to give you a checklist. I'm also going to have randomly in my classroom different timers. Okay? So you guys are doing independent practice. You need to work on this independent practice for a total of 15 minutes. When the timer goes off, you move. If you look at the sample checklists that are coming along, it's just set your timer for. And I forgot to give you the best part. I have packets here for you guys that show you that. Oh, there's going to be an example. Yeah, you want to hear up? That'd be great. So you're going to have different checklists. I'm like, why don't you have your checklist in front of you? It's in the packet that's sitting right there. I will also give the students they can get some timers, too. So they're setting their own personal timer for how long they should work on different activities. I'm up with my mini list. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I need Andy, Kit, Blue, Pat, Grant. You stop what you are doing. You come to me. Okay? That checklist example is on page six. So if you turn to page six, that is exactly what I'm looking at. So there's actually an example of that checklist. So you still schedule time for those individual groups yes. on your, and they stop what they're doing yes. in that time. But I have to be very careful when I can meet with every single student. So I have my own personal timer. Yeah. So I can set my clock timer, I can set whatever, but I just go and I set this timer, and it just starts counting down. So when you come to my mini lesson, I have my timer. Okay, guys, we're going to work. We're going to be here for 15 minutes. Flip. Yeah. Does that make sense? Because I have to meet with everybody. Yeah. I can't just spend 45 minutes with my low kids. I need to work with everybody. So I set my own personal timer, too. Okay. So that checklist that I gave you is exactly what I use. I tell the kids, this is how long this one activity should be. This is what you need to do. So what if they need, because you were saying before, you're you lose the timers, but now you're giving them the timers yeah. for different sessions or sessions, right? Yep. 
what if they need more time than at a section? They have all week. That one checklist is a week long checklist. So they have all week to get it done. But this is what I normally do. If I have five days, I usually plan for four and a half days or four days of activities. One day is a day to get everything caught up. If you get done with it, then at the bottom of that checklist, it says working towards. You get to work on your project. You get to work on this. You get to work on that. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's see it in action, okay? So here's phase two in action. You will see exactly what I'm talking about. Here is that teacher doing a mini lesson. How many people does he have in the mini lesson? Two. Why two? Because those kids are ready for the mini lesson. So he is talking about the seasons and talking about how the earth has different seasons. When they're done with that mini lesson, they go back and they start working on their checklist. That checklist works for the whole week. The students, he has 28 students in his classroom. The students then are going and they're learning online using study jams. If you're a science teacher, that's really good. He's using study jams. He's also using Newsella. News ELA. Newzella is a really good program to help them understand the different seasons. As well as his textbook. We're going back to that print model that he was talking about. So the students have this checklist. They work through the checklist for the whole week. This teacher in a 45 to 50 minutes will meet with every single student at least once, if not twice. That second time would be for a checkpoint. So the students are working. 28 kids are in here. If I had the noise on, you'd be like, what? That's all the noise they're making? So now, look, the collaboration, where they're reading together. They can either read by themselves or read by the partner. And the future ready skill, they have to do a sorting activity of the different vocabulary words. So the kids in that group, there's five of them in that group, and they're back here doing the sorting activity. They manage themselves. Here's the thing. Phase one is really important. Your centers are really important because it's the training wheels to get to phase two. I know you're going to have questions, so I'm going to push you into this environment. We're going to do this right now. I wish I had all day with you. This would be so much fun. <laughs> but we do. We have an hour. So what we're going to do is I'm going to give you different activities. This website, I would highly recommend you going to because you can get a copy of that digital checklist and a daily checklist. So you're going to type in bit.ly slash blend ed, watch in this case sensitive, AP. So that's where I want you to go to. When you go to this website, you're going to see a bunch of different resources there. When you're going to have time to explore in your packet, and I'll repeat this again because we're all moving there. You have time to explore in your packet. You will have time to uh, go look at few different classrooms. And I brought some of my favorite hands-on activities that you can take a look at. And I'm going to put these back here. So you will be able to go and explore some hands-on activities you can implement into your classroom. Anybody need help with that website? Nope, you got it. Perfect. You see all the different resources there. There's even a notes page. If you have questions or comments, feel free to post it. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just call you back. I'm going to do like two different mini lessons. I'm going to do one mini lesson with teachers who are basically online teachers. We're going to talk to you about that. So online teachers, you go explore first. If you're in a brick and mortar, you're with me first. Okay? So that way we can kind of differentiate. So there's hands-on activities back there, as well as, I'm going to put two more different activities. There are a game of slap seat and a game of chameleon. You will have to figure out how to play them. These are some of my absolute favorites. Chameleon, the only reason why I bought this game is because it says blend in. Literally, it says blend in the word. That's the only reason, and it's one of my absolute favorite games to play. So there's four different tables back here with four different activities. You get to pick. If you want to come to me first, come on up. If you want to go and explore, go and explore. We're just going to rotate twice just as we have a short amount of time. Okay? Ten minutes. Let's do this. All right. Well, you guys are such a quiet group. <laughs> That's a lot. I like it. Come on up. Grab a chair. Come on up. Get cozy. 
this is what's so great about blended learning, is you get to get to know each other. You get to spend time with each other. So come on up. We're classroom teachers, right? Most of us? Yes? Okay. Did phase one make sense? You already have a handle on it. You already like, I see the wheels turning. It's fun. It is fun, right? Okay. Questions? Mr. Hay. It's <laughs> okay. I'm not. Second lowest group would do say tech first, so that I didn't have to worry about them going doing independent practice, but not being independent enough to like do it. Right. Yeah. So if they get to just pick where they go on their they own, they don't yet. Yes. Oh, like no, are you in phase one or phase two? What do you mean by phase yeah. phase two? Yeah. Phase one is the the rotation with the time. So I'm right. going to strategic with that, and I'm going to okay. have that all set up. I'm talking phase, I guess maybe phase two, right? When you said, give us your checklist, checklist and, right? Yeah. So, so what we, we do is we put in blocks on our checklist. Yeah. So they cannot go to that activity until I give them the key. What do I mean by the key? They come with me, I start it off, and then they can it's open. Oh, that's brilliant. I know. Where were you like? I know that's what we're talking about. So that little block is just the ability to block the station before they move forward. If you are doing what we're talking about in phase one where we're rotating and you don't want them to do anything, instead of what all the ghost is, on our block is a block that talks about the ghost. I have a step by step guide on what you can do. Watch the video. If you're phase one. That means nobody starts an independent practice. You said that same here. It's, 
It's not. But I'm oh, like, it's right now. Okay. <laughs> um, so that is something that we wanted to put. So I'm going to put that in here right now so you have a list here. And it goes through because basically no resource is independent. They have to go to me first before they move on. It's the same thing as that block. The block represents your new program. Okay. Any other questions? I think we have one over here. Yeah. Okay, so let's do this. What I want to talk about, we kind of have the idea of phase one. Um, I want to skip ahead to change your space. So when you're doing this, you guys set up a space where you have the ability for kids to uh, have flexible food, furniture, and stuff. Okay, this is just spent $50 on a car sale, and she came up with this. What it is is basically, she, went, she found three things are on Facebook Marketplace, if you have that, where she went in and she created a blended learning environment is a fifth grade classroom. Come on, play. So she has a place where they can do their showcase. Now they have a place where they can read together. Those are old finely kept pieces. I just put a tablecloth on it for her. She has a little coffee table she got for free in a dumpster dive. A digital content bar. But if you notice, everything was on the outside, and then the inside is her traditional classroom. She can flip back and forth between the two. Because she's doing it only for that right now when the furniture is on the blanket jars. But the whole idea is that she took her traditional classroom and broke it apart. So again, there's your mini lesson. Her free coffee table from diving. I love digital content bars. Those are key. Because if I had this one sitting up, I'd see their screens. So a digital content bar, if you're sitting here, I can see what you're doing over there. And of course, just you know, just kind of fun things. Just part of the house. So only using that for that center time. Blended learning for or blended learning is only yeah. for that, not for. You know, sometimes you'll go into the classroom and they're like, "Oh, we have flexible seating," and the kids are falling off balls and they're like hiding under stuff. Yeah, like you're going, "Are you actually oh, really taking oh. anything in?" Like. So, of course, she's going to get right now for math, language, arts, if they have silent reading, you can go to a specific area. Great. I love the high gallon buckets. Storage also, it's a skateboard, so she has extra storage. And if you can interest it, how to do five gallon buckets, and you can design a five gallon bucket of the way. Since the kids are always moving, they have like little cubbies that they can go in for their stuff. I want to show you a first grade classroom. This first grade classroom is very impressive. No name tags on the desk. Now the kids are able to work in all these different environments from working inside the tent, working with a teacher, the digital content bar, sitting on the floor with their computers. But she has it set up in a very kid friendly place. Not a lot of her stuff. You notice that? I don't know what it is without my teacher, but we just hoard. We're hoarders in, all, in the classroom. I was a second grade classroom. I brushed it all myself. But now we have flexible seating options too. This is the seating chart. These videos also on them? They aren't. Not yet. Okay, we can put some of them out there. You go to that blog post that I just posted there. There is a lot of different videos. And one of the different activities you can do for the classroom that you can see all the time. Being organized to see the furniture that went to the dollar tree, the dollar store, they found this little push light. Speaking of push lights, this will be one of the last things I can share with you. Let's say you're doing something, right? And you're having kids working, and I'm doing a mini lesson. Pretend you're my independent practice, pretend you're my digital content, pretend you are my future ready. Tap your life. Tap it again. Tap it again. Tap it again. Tap it one more time. If you have a question, I would you change it now. So if I'm in my mini lesson, I can see that, oops, there's red going on, right? There's, oops, you know, questioning. If you know what you're doing, what color would you put it to? Green or actually the kids really like the blue. Okay? But guess what? It's time to rotate or I need to be the group. So I can quickly change your colors. Or I can give you a warning. So I can give you get a warning. I know, right? So now it's going to start flashing colors. That's your one minute warning. Hey, I need this next group, just let me know. Wherever you are, you can keep your face too. I'm just going to call the next group in one minute. Or if you're being, if you're in phase one where you're rotating, now they have it. Or guess what? Fire drill. Here we go, gotta go. Stop what we're doing. It's like, paper $16 and link is on that pad. She's a color genie. 
pucks. Just like puppy pucks. I just have to be careful. I have a farmer accent. Sometimes it doesn't come out as puck. It comes out as an inappropriate word. And this will, like, so these little things are good also. And after my mini lesson, I have my don't bug me antlers. So that means if I have my antlers on, it means I love you, but go find somebody else to answer your question. Okay? And then sometimes teachers forget to walk to lunch and they start on their don't bug me antlers on. I do have high school teachers even doing something like this, like something fun and crazy, either with a scarf or a hat or whatever it is. Not education. Some of my colleagues just have a lamp, and that's when that lamp is on. You can even do it with like these like little cap lights too. If my light is on, go away. You know, same thing. The lamp, the light, is something. You know, and then my group is blue. Shoo. When I was second grade, everything has to arrive. Oh, yeah. The point is, when we're doing this, and you have your packet, in your packet, you have a description of what it is and what it looks like. Your next option, that I bring back that other group, is you can go and explore this different activity. But I do, you can actually spend time creating a phase one lesson plan. Write it out. How could you change it? You could also take time to think about your lesson, and you might be teaching next week, and bring it into this. When I was in my classroom with one of my teachers last Friday, he's a substitute. But the year before, he was the student teacher that was sell him there. Now, working for the school as a full time substitute, the teacher left with saying, Here's my book, teach from your book. He came running through, saw me in the hallway, saying, Marsha, help me, help me, I can't do this. And in 40 minutes, I had laid out this whole entire week in this format. So, here are your mini lessons. Here's what you're doing to it. Here's your digital content that I like to it. And here's your digital writing skills. So when you get used to this format, it's my point. At first it seems overwhelming, but it gets pretty easy. You just kind of plug and play. This is a great resource to get you started, as well as that link, those links that I put in there. Okay, I'm going to bring the next group back. Here's your options, what you could do. Create a phase one lesson plan. Go play. Go look at classroom videos. You have your choice. Yes, my dear. Junior high. Love it. Would you start with phase one? Phase one, one for sure. Yes. Absolutely. Come to the middle school one, or the high school tomorrow, because I'm going to do high school, so it's through 7 through 12, and I'll show you what does that look like in that environment. Do you have examples of your uh, yeah, chef? Yeah. Um, I do. Uh, there's a packet going around. There's a bunch of them going. Oh, that one there. Yep, there's that. This one here is a differentiated one. Oh, that's part of it. Uh, nope, that's it. So that one's differentiated. She gave a pre-assessment on Friday. She gave a, that one you're looking at is the average student on the back. Is the higher student. And then this one is what you give them because they're struggling. Okay. Same checklist, just breaks it into different parts. Her original goal was to cut these and get the struggling students so they just have things to focus on here. But then the kids felt bad and they had just a single paper. So she gives them the whole piece of paper and just folds it. Here's what you need to work on today. Right? You gotta play the game. Tally, outwit, outsmart, outplay. So, that's not right. So, can I take pictures of these? Are they on? Yeah, you, you definitely take pictures when they're not. And then that packet, too, there's some examples as well. All right, I'm kicking you out of here because I gotta get them back here. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Hey, my group in the back, come on up. Glinty. There we go. You're gonna take pictures. Yeah, awesome. I'm going to. Oh, sorry. I'm trying to hand it to you. <laughs> Sure. It is the light. My head is in it. It's kind of shiny. It's terrible. It's okay. I'll still be able to hold it. And it just flips to flip it So, like, whatever it is, like 15 minutes, I flip it 15 minutes, 15 minutes up, it starts to come out. And it is 35, 10, 15. There's one now that has 1, 5, 10, 15. So, there's different increments. Just Google search, cube. Is, it so literally is right China. <laughs> like it was like on its way. Like I the packaging came right from there. All right, you guys are my fun people. Yay! So do you ever see your kids face to face? You do. All right. So let's talk about those things. Do they come to you how often? One day a week. One day a week. Every day. Okay. So you had to think about how to get them to do those hands-on activities. Okay. What about you? Um. Just learning. Just learning. Yeah. Okay. Are you going to tell one? Oh, yeah. Oh, the movie ball. You know, it's one of my absolute favorites. That was our Thanksgiving game over here last year. And I dressed up. I really like that. What about you, Sarah? 
hardly ever, once or twice a year, maybe. For the bulk of them, uh, I see them on Skype. Okay, so let her focus with you guys when they're not with you. How do we get them to create? How do we get them to communicate? How do we get them to collaborate if they're not with you? Does that sound good plan? So I'm going to start out by sharing because this classroom setup is going to really work for you. Except for when you guys come in, you still want to have them on in five places. But we want to get that so like, how are my online resources going to be good for you? So I'm going to walk you through some different activities and some basically online things to get those kids creative. Is that sound good, plan? This first one is called Incredibox. Okay, tell me, my friend, what is Incredibox? It's like you can build your own actual music group. So if one guy might be like the drum voice, and the next guy will be singing, and you can build layers of sound. Yeah. Let's create one, okay? Oh, yeah. Okay, so what's going to happen is you create, you put clothes on. We're going to pretend they're just at the beach and they're just with the board shorts. Hold on, let me make sure it goes here. Usually I just have a video playing of it. But you go, oh, come on. It's taking a second. See, it's the wireless. It, we're going to pretend, yes. <laughs> Let's try it one more time. Let's see if this one will work. Usually I have the best book with this, this section. Just, just be patient if you want it to load. That's hard. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. I've crashed three times here. Okay. <laughs> Let's just go with this. It is exactly what she says. Basically, these little characters pop up. Okay, you put different clothes on them. They're going to have different themes, different music. It is a lot of fun. The kids really like it. So what you're going to do is, if you're doing a lesson on poetry or rhyming words or passing a fluency, you would have them create their beat first. Then beats playing in the background. They record themselves on Flipgrid. Have you used Flipgrid? So Flipgrid going, but the beat is in the background. So they hit play, they go into Flipgrid, that beats there, but they're working on using that beat for students to practice. I know, I'm super smart with that, right? Yes. Yeah, Flipgrid is the recorder. And it gets them excited. Yeah, because they're making their beats and their music, it gets them excited about what they're creating. I like that one. So there's two. Flipgrid, Incredibox. Let's go back to our, our other one that we have here. Sorry, I have a lot of things going on. This is View the Classroom. There's even more resources on here, too. You can get some ideas in. But I'm looking for it. You guys ever have that happen? We have some new web websites there. The next one is Storyboard Back. Have you used this one? Yes. Have you hacked the system? Okay, let me show you how to hack the system. So story for that is basically creating a first sentence or a comic strip, okay? I'm going to just start. I have all these abilities to drop in different places, different things, different people. Your kids will love this. If you're teaching about Johnny Yap, well, what do you guys tell? Like, what is the company in your first grade? Seasons? Seasons? What are you teaching? Communities. Communities. Oh, perfect. Communities. So you can drop the little people in and make speech buttons. You can move them up and down. You can change their hair. You can change their color. You can change what they're wearing. Here's your hat. If I would have paid this, I have to pay like $50, $60 a year for it. I don't have that money. So I just go in, take a screenshot, and drop it into my cool dog. <laughs> yep, saving it makes you pay more. But all I do is I take a screenshot, now I save it, now I have to go and drop things to my Google Doc or Google Slide, and they can type even more about what's happening. Sequence of events. The story cubes for sure can be in there. They can tell their story. Okay, let's give you another one too. Do you like this little story? Yeah. yeah. I like this. One that you can also do. This one is it. So we were talking earlier about digital citizenship. What does that look like? I put in here s'more.com. Have you ever done a s'more? Yes, you're a little tech girl. Yeah. I'm going to give you some. I'll tell you No, I have plenty. No, you're fine. So s'more.com is a online poster maker. And I hope it pops up here. Because what it is the kids yeah. make a poster, right? But then they share it with their classmates. They share it with their 
family. When they get married, people dispute their skin and see where in the world they actually got their poster travel to. So now, hopefully, it will show you here. Now the kids have the ability to go in and you can actually see, wow, it is important that what I post is good stuff because people will see from everywhere. It's not popping up. We'll hang tight, okay? That's okay. Just go back in. You can take a look at s'more.com. It is a resource. You'll be able to see all of my stuff and all the resources that go along with it. That's just a couple. I have these other ones. Let me give you a couple more. Okay. Tell me something that you are teaching or you are struggling with or would like to help with. This makes it more meaningful. Okay. So, first, how to use making word lists. Word lessons. Oh, making words. Do they have Chromebooks or iPads? Chromebooks. Okay. So let's just. I know when we have iPads, it gives us little help tingly. So you actually go in and stamp words and stamp up your words for them. Give me a minute for making the words on me. Usually my kids are always doing it hands on. Give me a minute to make a bigger one. I know. How do we do that? Right. Could they even, could they use a piece of paper of their own? Like, do they have it instead of paper or you can make it easier with the words they had about credit and then record them? You do that. Okay. You just want to be able to have it online. Let me think about it. What are you working on? 